Forging is controlled deformation of metal under pressure. Forging has come a long way since the village blacksmith pounded out tools and hardware on an anvil. Today, modern forging techniques are used to make many aircraft engine parts. Basic forging processes involve deforming metal, usually hot, between two dies. Open dies, shown here, are often used for rough shaping large ingots into forms that are subsequently machined. Forging metal into specific shapes is done with closed dies. The lower die is stationary and the upper die is driven into the metal, forcing it to take the shape of the die. Flashing is the excess material which has been squeezed out of the die. This is removed by subsequent trimming operations. Die force is obtained by presses, which are hydraulically or mechanically activated, or by hammers, which may be air or steam driven or even gravity operated. Upsetting is a type of forging involving a compressive force along the longitudinal axis of the workpiece. Extruding forces a large piece through an orifice which results in a smaller cross-section but longer piece. Most of the common forging methods will be shown here as we follow the steps in forging engine compressor blades. After the inspection of raw material, you will see cutting the slugs, extrusion of the slug, upset, block forge, final or finish forge, trimming the flash, toll gate and deburring, and cast to prepare for machining. Raw stock in the form of titanium and stainless steel rods is received and stored in secured storage cages. Each rod is carefully inspected for hidden flaws by means of an ultrasonic machine. Rods are rotated and gradually fed through a housing on the equipment which contains a fluid and transducer. An ultrasonic wave is generated by the submerged transducer which penetrates the metal and is bounced back to a receiving device. Any discontinuity in the rod is shown as a blip on the screen and is accompanied by an audible squeal. By slowly rotating the rod, the exact location of a possible discrepancy is located. This area is marked for subsequent disposition. Strict quality control requirements are important through the entire forging process. Acceptable material is then cut into slugs of the proper length for the specific part to be forged. Rods must be heated to a red hot temperature of 1300 to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit before cutting to length. Heating is accomplished by means of an electrical induction setup. This causes a current to flow through the rod which generates the heat. At the precise time, the heated rod is released and pushed into the cutter feed mechanism. Cut slugs are now ready for the next operation. Before forging can start, the slug is coated with a ceramic silicate glass lubricant. This prolongs dye life and helps prevent contamination of the part during heating and forging operations. Coating with this type material is necessary between all major forging operations. A typical forge press is being set up here. Notice the rotary furnace located to the operator's left. Extrusion is the first major forging process. 
Here, the cross section is reduced and the part elongated in preparation for subsequent forging operations. Slugs are heated to a temperature of approximately 1700 to 1950 degrees Fahrenheit in the rotary electric furnace. One complete revolution in the furnace brings the slugs to the proper forging temperature. Before each cycle, the dyes are lubricated with a graphite spray to prolong dye life. As one cold slug is placed in the furnace, a heated one is ready to be forged. 75 to 300 tons pressure is applied to the slug, which forces the extrusion. The completed extrusion is pushed from the die and ready for the next step. Inspection checks are important to ensure surface finish and contours meet in-process requirements. After being visually inspected, the radius is checked on this optical comparator. Grid lines on the screen provide for accurate measurements. Upset forging is the next major operation. It is the upset that will eventually become the dovetail section. Notice for safety purposes, both hands are needed to actuate the presses. Parts which were previously extruded are heated in a rotary furnace. Heated parts are placed in the die and upset formed by the force of typically over 100 tons. Parts at this point are ready for block forge. It was mentioned earlier that ceramic silicone coating is applied between major operations. These in-process parts have been extruded and upset. They are now dipped in ceramic material prior to block forge. Different coatings are used depending on part material and the forging process to be done. Some parts lend themselves to electrostatic spraying of the coating. This machine automatically turns and sprays coating material on parts, resulting in even and complete coverage. Coated parts are now ready for block forge. At this stage, the part will begin to take final form. Basically, the same procedure is followed. Graphite is sprayed into the upper and lower die. Parts are heated in the rotary furnace. Pressure from the upper die squeezes the material to conform to the die configuration. These block forged parts will be coated and will then be ready for the next operation. Coated parts are ready for final forging the last major operation in the cycle. As in previous forging operations, the block forged parts are heated in the furnace for anywhere from four to 15 minutes, depending on part volume. Careful graphite spraying is necessary to ensure a smooth finish, as the die configuration at this point reflects the final airfoil configuration. Quenching the dovetail end and trimming are additional steps done here. Trimming removes all flashing which has been squeezed out of the die. The forging operations we have seen so far have been done in mechanical presses. Some of the smaller compressor blades are forged on air hammers. Slugs here are heated by means of small induction coil heaters. In only a few seconds, the slug reaches forging temperature. Slugs at this operation are rough or block forged. This air hammer is final forging blades. This is followed by a trimming operation to remove the flash. Induction heating for small parts is quick and convenient.
This shows the sequence of slug, two block forge, two final forge. Forging dies are carefully made from high carbon steel. They will typically last for a thousand cycles before wearing to the point of needing rework or repair. Upper and lower dies are stored and used in pairs. When repair is necessary, it requires the skill of die makers using hand benching equipment in conjunction with a series of gauges. Remember that the forged airfoil will only be as accurate as the die. Back lighting of the gauge shows high points which are ground away. A different type of gauge is used here. This guillotine gauge is used with a transfer paper, which leaves a continual line when the cross section coincides exactly with the gauge. Any high points will leave a broken line, which requires careful grinding to correct. Complex concave sections of the die are accurately formed using electrical discharge machining techniques. Controlled metal removal is possible with this equipment. This recess being machined will form a mid-span damper section of a compressor blade. Fluid normally surrounding the machining area has been drained to allow observation of the process. There are many additional steps necessary to complete a blade after the actual forging has been done. A deburring operation removes sharp edges and burrs from the part. Minor blemishes or folds are also polished out. Heat treating of parts at this point is necessary to relieve the stresses induced by various heating and forging operations. Vacuum furnaces such as this hold hundreds of parts at one time. Overall cycle times of up to eight hours are needed to load and evacuate the furnace, bring parts up to temperature, and then cool the parts. This is a slow but very necessary part of the forging process. Airfoil sections of blades are usually up to 10 thousandths oversize. A method of measuring airfoil sections has been developed to accurately determine how much material must be removed to meet finished drawing requirements. Each blade is measured at a minimum of three sections simultaneously using electronic probes. Immediately, the display panel indicates if the blade is okay, oversize, or is undersized. Oversized blades are identified by the amount of stock needed to be removed as indicated on the panel. These blades will have material removed by means of chemical milling, which we'll see in a moment. You may have noticed that some numbers on the control panel are mirror images. This allows the operator to determine the status of each blade through a mirror without turning. Data from each blade is collected by means of a direct computer hookup to the measuring equipment and accessed by this terminal. This data is used to statistically analyze the forge processes and to flag an area when die wear is evident and needs correction. All pertinent data concerning a single blade at all measurement sections is shown on the screen. We mentioned earlier the need to chem mill blades that are oversized. This is the area where the chem milling is done using hydrofluoric and chromic acid. Depending on the amount of stock to be removed, the length of time in the acid is determined and the timer set. The rotating action of the basket ensures even material removal. In only a few minutes, enough material has been removed 
and the blades have a smooth surface finish and are ready for a final measurement. Although not directly related to the forging process, you might be interested in how the airfoil section is held to allow machining of the dovetail. Each blade is secured in a locating fixture of this casting equipment. A material called salicast melts at 475 degrees Fahrenheit and is poured around the airfoil. It rapidly cools and solidifies. In only a few minutes, the block form has cooled to the touch and is removed. This block configuration now allows for fixturing for standard milling operations shown here and for subsequent broaching operations. The cast form is shown before and after milling operations. When all machining operations have been done, the low temperature salicast cast is melted away, leaving the finished blade. Forging compressor blades involves many steps. Ultrasonic inspection. Cutoff. Extruding, upsetting, block forge, finish forge, trim, deburring, heat treat. chemical milling, and finally, preparation for machining.